We are about to talk about something really, in my mind, we are getting to something that you all might know a little bit about. <laughs> uh, we've talked a little bit about AI and industry, which has been my world, right? Working at Microsoft and Amazon and all those places. We talked about AI in justice, which justice also fails across a bunch of different areas, but specifically with Renee and her experience in criminology uh, and her experience working with data scientists trying to solve some of these problems. Um, and so now it's finally time to talk a little bit about how this touches you maybe directly in education. So I am going to bring up Charlotte. She's going to talk to you about AI education and give you a little bit about her maybe history, a little introduction, tiny bit about how you got here. Um, so let's give her a big round of applause. Hey guys. Uh, my name is Charlotte Dungan. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of a nonprofit called the AI Education Project. And what we do is educate high schoolers primarily about the impacts of AI education. All of you will be affected and are affected by the changes in technology that have happened in your lifetime. And today I'm specifically going to talk about corporations and government and how they already have your most private data, which is your DNA. Um, I was also, I'll give you a little bit of background. I um, was a pr computer programmer for 10 years. I have initially a degree in English and history. Uh, so I was a liberal arts major who worked in tech. And um, I also have a degree in learning and teaching. And I worked briefly for Scratch Education. So if you've ever played with Scratch, any Scratch people? Scratchers, former Scratchers? A little bit, all right. So I worked on the teacher side of things, like how can we use Scratch in classrooms? Um, and uh, yeah, that's me. I, I've been a teacher. I worked at uh, NCSSM for a couple of years and got to teach AI here. So that's where we're coming from. So today we're gonna start with a visit to the doctor. I have a son, he's 13 years old. He um, broke his arm playing soccer and we went to the doctor to determine if he was gonna get his cast off. Um, and when we went into the doctor's office, that was on the wall. And that is an AI device that can record audio and video. Anybody really excited to see audio and video in your exam room? <laughs> Um, there's a little sign on the wall that, that gives you more information, but it just gives you um, a place to read about the research they were doing. There's not a way to opt out. And that QR code, it actually um, shows your patient information number. So I can't scan that and get more information. I just get a number. Am I cutting in and out a little bit? Am I okay? All right. Um, so this was on the wall, and the effect it immediately had was for my son to stop talking. So we were deciding what kind of cast he should get and whether or not he'd be able to play in the soccer championships, and he stopped communicating with me because it was being recorded. Now the benefit of this technology is that the notes that the doctor would normally have to take and transcribe is time that that doctor can use to see more patients and to be sure that the conversation that happens in the room is recorded accurately. So the doctor isn't making up what was said, it's actually recorded and transcribed automatically using artificial intelligence. And so the idea is that could we increase the number of patients or the quality of visit by having this, this routine task that doctors do have, they have to do it over and over and over again to write down what was said. And so maybe this device could take some of that out of the loop. Um, for me though, it was, it was a, a little bit eye-opening in where AI is showing up. I didn't expect it to be in the exam room. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit. I wanna talk about the difference between DNA and biometrics. Biometrics are the external things on your body, like your fingerprints, the way your face is shaped. Um, and there's a cool professor at UNC Wilmington, UNCW, and this is Dr. Carl Rickenek, and he has done facial recognition for something like 30 years. Um, so I, I wanted to show you what he's doing because he created a program called Face My Age, and he can take someone's photo, tell them how old they are, but he can also tell you whether or not you have diabetes, 
whether or not you've ever been a smoker, whether or not you do drugs or drink, he can tell you about what age you might die. Uh, and so his research, um, I'm gonna show you a video, I think. We're gonna try it, we're gonna see if this works. Um, this is a, a, a sample of how, um, well, first we're gonna watch an ad from Google. Thanks, Google. Um, yeah, it takes 13 seconds, but uh, Carl Rickenek, Dr. Carl Rickenek has worked on this for almost 30 years, and he uses facial recognition and these aging systems in really cool and positive ways. For example, the U.S. Center for Missing and Exploited Children, if someone disappears at age two or three, he can age their face much more accurately than he used to to be able to tell what they would look like at 15 or 25 or 35 to identify a missing child as they age. So this is um, just a, a video of how he does that. Um, and by using AI, they can transform a face forward and backward. So here is an example of a person who's getting their face scanned. And you can see, here they are. Yeah, how can you turn the, the face forward or backward? Let's watch. Anybody have Google Photos here? Google Photos? Yeah, so uh, you can set up Google Photos to recognize who you are. And if you're seven years old or two years old or 14 years old, it still knows it's you. So this is that same technology um, that is happening over with Dr. Rickenick. So if, you, if you're interested in facial recognition, UNCW. Um, so there's biometrics happening all over the world. Again, these are the external things that people can see. Um, they are not your DNA. Um, biometric data is being used all around the world with AI systems. If you've ever been to Disney or Universal Studios, they take your fingerprint. As of 2016, they take the fingerprints of children under age 10. Prior to 2016, they didn't take your fingerprints. But now, if you're a four-year-old going to see Mickey for the first time, you have already given a corporation, one of the most powerful corporations in the world, your biometric data. Um, this, this up here, the picture up here on the, whatever direction that is, the faces and the numbers, that is in China. That's your social credit score. They use your face to do things like pay for items. Um, but also, China uses um, your facial recognition and body profile to tell if you jaywalk. Mm -hmm. And if you jaywalk, then your score may go down because you're breaking the law. Uh, the social credit score of a popular TV personality was, they were pasted on the side of a bus, and their score went down and down and down because the bus kept driving around the block. And every time they were cited with their face was on the bus as jaywalking. Um, and sometimes these systems are hard to fight because there's no criminal system that you've entered into. You're simply, um, your data is being used and you don't have a lot of recourse. So that's one, that's China's using social credit. Um, social credit impacts things like, can you get an apartment? Can you ride on the train? Um, you can make your social credit go up in, in important ways like, did you donate to charity? Your government is paying attention to that kind of thing. Are you being a good citizen? And mostly that score is tracked by your, by your face. Um, and then down here at the bottom, this is India. This is the airport uh, in India. You can see sort of the words behind. And um, India has the largest facial recognition database in the world where they are um, using facial recognition to, you know, you can't travel without this, without being in the system. But more importantly, in India, there's a caste system and some people have more or less rights. Um, and so an equity issue can be now managed by the state, whether or not you have access to certain places um, based on facial recognition. So your data externally, your fingerprints, your face, are in systems to allow us to access places and we don't necessarily have control over our data in those systems. Okay, so now we also have our data that's in our DNA and also our physical characteristics. This is a picture of uh, being able to predict 
people's race from their x-ray images. So if you go and you have that broken arm, maybe we can tell if you're Asian. Um, it's it's uh, controversial because obviously we want, um, we know that there's bias in medical systems and how you look can affect what kind of care you get. It's also important to know your race and to consider some uh, external factors that may affect your health. So I'm married to a man who's Chinese and people uh, who are of Chinese descent often have trouble with lactose intolerance. It means that after a certain age you can't process uh, foods that are made from animal milk. And um, just by knowing his race, then he, we know that he's much more susceptible. About 98% of Asian people eventually struggle with lactose intolerance. So by knowing his race, we're able to have better health care. Um, but that, the other thing can be true. We know that outcomes for black women who have babies are typically twice as uh, risky as a white woman of the same age. And so uh, we want to make sure that the, the health care that we give is not biased against people because of their race. And so the issues in uh, you know, race that we can identify from our medical scans needs to be protected in some way. The idea of these technologies is not that they're good or bad, but that they can be used for good or bad, and that we need to create control systems and processes and procedures and laws to keep them working for us, for our benefit, and not simply for um, convenience or profit for a corporation. This picture on the left here is of uh, breast tissue. You can see the beginnings of a cancer. It's very, very small. So a radiologist may have difficulty in identifying that sample, especially if they've look, looked at 150 other samples the same day. And so sometimes the best thing we can do with AI is to have a human plus AI. If the AI can recognize a few cases where it might be worth a closer look by a human, but it can screen out the things that are definitely not cancer or definitely cancer and, and leave those questionable cases to a human, then we get better outcomes than if we have human alone or AI alone. And AI is transforming biology and medicine. This uh, headline says it will change everything. DeepMind's AI has made a gigantic leap in solving protein structures. A good friend of mine, she is a, a neuroscientist. She has her PhD, and her whole PhD th thesis was based on mapping three proteins, figuring out how three proteins could fold, and she has a doctorate from that. And she's really important in, in, it was really important data in figuring out how brain chemistry works so that we can solve diseases like Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, et cetera. And so when we use AI, recently we figured out how to model the protein folding of all known proteins in the world. So it used to take a person dedicating 20 years of their career to use that information. And now we have a program that can do all of that initial work right now. And how transformative that is for us to have better medicines and therapies for people who have genetic conditions. So if you are thinking about going into medicine or research or you, you want to solve some problems with, with uh, healthcare, um, a lot of the work is started for you. There's a lot more clinical work to be done. Um, AI is also transforming what we can do to address single mutation diseases. Um, so sickle cell anemia is a very painful condition where your red blood cells fold like a sickle instead of being round. They essentially become pokey, it hurts. And it can r cause a lot of internal damage inside your body. Another. Um, Chronic issue is cystic fibrosis. When I was a kid, um, the, the life expectancy for a person with cystic fibrosis was 18 years old. And now it's more than doubled. The therapies have gotten better and better and better. And b with AI, by using technology to solve some of these problems, right now with sickle cell anemia, we have um, AI helping to manage pain. They're managing the chronic pain that happens with sickle cell. And in cystic fibrosis, you can see they have a whole conference related to AI and medicine that is, is talking about precision medicine. That means medicine for you, for your body specifically. It's tailored to your genetics and your DNA. 
All right, Slido time. If you uh, are, have, have you know, had the post-lunch jitters and you have um, lost a little bit of, um, you're falling asleep here, we're gonna do a little, hopefully, a little Slido. If you guys wanna go to Slido, I tried to um, bring it up on the screen. It's ELC 2022, that's all right. We'll just bring it back up here. That's no problem. Okay, so Slido. You're gonna go to Slido wherever you did before, ELC 2022, and I wanna ask you a question. The Slido question is, have you ever given a, or done one of those DNA tests? Like, yes. Have you taken a DNA test from a popular company, such as Ancestry.com, 23andMe, MyHeritage? It doesn't have to only be one of those. If you've done it yourself, say yes. If a parent has done it, choose the second option. If a sibling or grandparent has done it, choose the third. If you, you have more than one person you know that has done it, choose the one that's closest to you. So you, then a parent, then a sibling or grandparent, then a family friend. If you would, but you haven't, let me know. If you're just not interested, fine. And if it's too scary, no way, choose that one too. We have 64 responses, nice job guys. Yeah, set, wow, 71, that's awesome. So when you go to one of these sites, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, um, MyHeritage, you may learn, huh, I have a sibling I didn't know about. Oh, uh, you mean I'm actually at risk for cancer? Didn't know that. Oh my goodness, I'm related to the King of England. You might learn any or all of these things just by having um, participated in this, and it need not only be you. Let's see if I can see the results of this. I think I can. Let's try it. Do, do, do. And it's this one. How do I see the results? Can you guys see it? Oh, I see it. 9% yes, 11% not me, but a parent. I would, but I could, but I haven't. Only 5%, scary, no way. So let's see, about 80% of you, hopefully some of you online are doing this too, uh, but about 80% of you are, have either done it or would. About 20%, not for you. Cool. Okay, let's go back to our show. I'm gonna talk about the risks of sharing this data because um, because I think you should know so that you can make an informed decision. You can totally share your information. Millions of people have made that decision. That's okay. But I don't think people talk as much about the risks. The first is um, hacking is real. It does happen on these sites. Um, the most recent, I have the number. Let me look it up. I wanna make sure I get the right number. It is 92 million accounts on MyHeritage were hacked. Um, they are not certain that the DNA data was stolen, but people who have gotten their DNA screened, they definitely knew who these people are. Um, so hacking is something that you have to think about. Who could get your data and how is it protected? Did you choose a company that actually cares about your data protection and privacy? The second is if you're one of the people who have opted into doing this testing or someone in your family has, um, the company's profit for the, from the data that you share with them because over 80% of participants, of people who choose to share their DNA, choose that they, it can be used for research. And that research is profitable for companies like Pfizer. Um, so when you share your data and you choose to let it be used for research, uh, the companies profit. They're able to use your data for that. Um, the third is there's a very few privacy laws that protect your genetic information. One being GINA, the Genetic Information Act, um, but, but it, it's not caught up to modern technology. So there aren't privacy laws that are really robust and thoughtful about your data. So when you give it away, it's not necessarily secure. The fourth is that law enforcement can access your data from these websites. And the ethics around that is, is still somewhat murky. 
um, because we have had really important cases solved with genetic data coming from these websites, but the laws about subpoenas in particular are very vague about what can be requested and required. I will give a shout out to 23andMe who they pro publish a transparency report. They share how many uh, people have um, had their data shared through a subpoena um, every year and they, they do that per region. So they say around the world where they're giving up their data. Um, and then um, it's really important to say too that your data is protected by a privacy policy you have to click, you do it all the time, right? You all click on privacy policies when you sign into a website. Scroll, 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 click, 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 right? But this is your genetic data, and they have an agreement with you, and that agreement can be updated at any time. Because these are companies. They can change their privacy policies. They can literally just let you know. We've decided to share your data now. We've sent you an update in an email. If you would like to agree to this privacy policy, do nothing, okay? So these aren't things, I'm not telling you not to go to these websites, but if you have a complicated family history, if people may come out of the woodwork if your family opts into these things, that might be a really good reason to opt out, to not choose to participate. If you're concerned about your privacy and the lack of laws, just wait. You don't have to do it now. Okay, but unfortunately your data's already been collected. So even if you didn't opt into a system like this, this is the picture of a newborn baby's foot. And in the United States, in all 50 states, babies are, this little card right here is a special type of paper that absorbs blood. And newborns are screened for genetic diseases that will be fatal without being caught. Um, so those are genetic, hormone, or metabolic screening. That's what this is for. They also do a hearing test. Um, but the data is collected and your blood is taken as a baby um, for a really good reason because up to 10,000 babies a year might die from these really rare disorders where if you just simply get some help at the start, those babies can be saved and they can grow up to be normal, healthy adults. Um, so the, the test itself is really important, but what happens to the data is dependent on what state you live in. Or, to be more specific, what state you were born in because you were a baby. So in North Carolina, this data is, is kept and collected for up to five years. The state isn't allowed to keep it after five years. In some states, this data is collected and saved for one month. And in some states, it's saved indefinitely. In fact, there are records dating back 40 or more years where these cards have been cataloged and your DNA or the DNA of people that you know and care about have been saved. And they're using it. So sometimes we can track down the bad guys with data. This is a case from 2016. This was not a newborn. This was a woman who um, was sexually assaulted. She had a rape kit on file because she was assaulted. And the police used her genetic information to charge her with a theft, a retail theft. They used her genetic information that had been stored in a police database in order to charge her with a different crime. Now, thankfully, there was a judge who said, there's no precedent for this, and threw out the case. But I know we did a little bit about law earlier. I hope this is a neat intersection for genetics. Um, it's concerning though because the laws don't exist to protect your data if it goes into one system and can be moved to another system. So that's a great place for us to have some innovation. Even if you haven't shared any information, this, this is a very bad dude. He was one of the scariest people ever. He, um, he, he murdered people, he was a really bad guy. Um, he stopped when DNA sequencing and testing came to California. So he was a police officer and knew that he was going to get caught. And so he stopped. Um, so he, GED Match was the database that identified him and um, they weren't approached. The company was not approached, but they did use his information and they caught him. The important thing here is that it wasn't his DNA. It was a family member who had done a test and they tracked it back to him. So um, 
it says criminals out there know they can be tracked down this way. They're going to have to try to not leave their DNA at the crime scene. It's nearly impossible. So previously, the only way we got genetic information from someone who is a criminal is by having them already in the system, and the good guys were protected. In this case, um, it, he, it didn't work for him. So now he's behind bars. Okay, so what can I do? Uh, this is a DVD of Gattaca, by the way. If you haven't seen it, it's out before you were born. It's a great movie to watch with your parents or you know, on your own when you're bored. Uh, Gattaca is this, the idea of what happens when we take genetic information too far. Um, what can you do? First of all, value your privacy. Speak up or opt out when something seems off. The second thing you can do is to vote and to ask your representatives to create protections for genetic privacy. I know not all of you are 18 but it is around the corner, my friends. And so you will have agency to ask your representatives to think about genetic privacy law. There's a lot of emphasis right now on tech policy and you can get this, these protections in place for yourself so that when you go to the doctor, your data stays yours. The third thing you can do is choose thoughtfully where you work. So as you think about your workplace and where you decide to go as an adult, you can do the same kinds of work with companies who value privacy and autonomy and tech for good, or you can choose a company that doesn't value those things. And when you choose thoughtfully where you work, you put your good resources into the world. The fourth thing you can do is spend your money with companies that share your values. So if you know that someone, some company um, doesn't value their employees, if they don't value, if they don't pay people fairly, then um, shop elsewhere. And then the last thing you can do is choose a college major or career where you can make a difference. And I mean this because if you're a journalist breaking these stories that we just read about, you can make a difference in the tech world. You can also, if you're going to be in artificial intelligence, computer science, data security, some other STEM field, um, you can take an ethics class. Do that while you're in school. Whatever school you're going into, if you're in tech, take an ethics class so that when you build things, they actually benefit humanity. And finally, keep in touch with me. I love high school students. Um, I'd love to talk with you here about your questions about what I've talked about today. I'd love for you to share information with me. I always learn from students when they write to me. So I'd love to hear what questions you have, but also what websites you're reading or what information you've downloaded. Um, and then finally, I do have some internships for students who are interested in AI. Um, and that's all. Thanks.